I'm sitting in the top branches of a grandmother oak. The bark of this ancient tree is rough on my hands and legs as I climb. This old oak is one of my favorite trees. I'm 10 years old and I'm in my woods. I've climbed this tree dozens of times since I started playing in this great expanse of nature just on the other side of our gravel drive. The branches sway in the soft breeze. The sun is shining on my face. Here, I'm happy. The woods were my sanctuary from a home life fraught with chaos and alcoholism. As an escape, I became a tree climbing virtuoso to the extent my dad nicknamed me Tarzan, which was cool when I was 10, mortifying in high school. <laughs> I grew up in a tiny shingle-sided farmhouse just north of Omaha, Nebraska. There were just two doorless bedrooms for the five of us. Because I was the youngest, I was relegated to sleep on the couch in the living room. Eventually, my couch was upgraded to a hide -a bed Years later, my sister moved off to college and her bed her bedroom became mine. The woods were the place where I played, used my imagination, and where I began a profound relationship with the creative. Those giant cottonwoods, grandmother oaks, and majestic elms became castles and fortresses, Aquaman's lair and the starship enterprise. There were the great easy climbers and the impossibles, trees with branches far too high for me to grab hold. These amazing trees were my secret friends and my greatest teachers. Little did I know, days after I had been sitting in that magnificent oak, bulldozers would arrive and begin to demolish my mentors, push them into towering mangled heaps, and unceremoniously set them ablaze. A few weeks later, I took my mom and sisters back to see where the woods used to be. 150 acres leveled. The pyres were still smoldering. We stood, we stared, and we cried. There's a grief and loss that haunts our lives and culture, like a sliver in our souls. I felt this heartache from so many people. I see this subtle longing at times when I'm asked, what do you do? And I say, I'm an artist. That moment sometimes sparks a wistful glint in people's eyes. A, a desire for something so familiar, yet so distant and out of reach. Collectively, we have been slowly untethered from the creative. The loss of those woods literally ignited my creativity. I was creative before the conflagration. I was the kid in class who was asked to draw aliens, hot rods, the Peanuts comics. My specialty was Snoopy. After the fires, I began to study and teach myself the elements of drawing, shading, texture, line, composition. I was not a likely candidate to become an artist. There were no artists in my family or in the neighborhood. Discussions of the arts didn't happen at home or in school. The list of artists I could name started with Leonardo and ended with da Vinci. <laughs> the only object on our walls at home was a paint by number of Jesus praying next to a large rock. I started studying objects intently and taught myself how to make them appear three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. A shy, chubby country boy using typing paper and number two pencils snuck into the vast cathedral of art and began drawing in a far off corner. A few years later, much taller and leaner, he put up a rickety easel in his newly acquired bedroom and taught himself to paint. He was calling himself an artist. Audaciously naming myself an artist was transformational. At the tender age of 10, I rose out of the ashes of those majestic woods and proclaimed, not that someday I was going to be an artist, but that I am an artist. From that moment on, I remained deeply inside the creative. In attics, garages, basements, large studios, some with heat, some without, the creative and I spent endless hours making art, thousands of drawings and paintings. In 1997, I was achieving my goal of being an independent artist. 
I had a 1,500 square foot live-in studio in Seattle. I was working on several commissions and I was deepening my involvement in the local art scene. After many years of working multiple part-time jobs, I was finally supporting myself as an artist. I had attained a dream that my family, friends, and teachers had said was impossible or highly unlikely. I was feeling an exuberance that I hadn't felt before as an artist, and I wanted to express this feeling in my art. Using myself as a figurative subject, a artist friend and I did a photo shoot with magnificent sweeping gestures. <laughs> it was awful. The frolicking poses looked ridiculous and painfully awkward. We looked like an advertisement for a Thomas Kincaid ballet. <laughs> After making several of these paintings, I cut them up and I painted over them. This idea of visually conveying joy lingered. It sort of haunted me. I couldn't figure out how to accomplish this. So I gave the project a name, the Exaltation Series. That didn't help. I kept trying. <laughs> I made thumbnails, I made sketches, studies, drawings. I made more paintings with different figures. I added drapery. <laughs> drapery worked for Renaissance painters. It didn't work for me. Everything I tried looked corny and contrived. Seven years later, having shelved the idea for a while, I made my way into exaltation through a surprising yet strangely familiar path, sorrow. The kindling this time was the death of my father. My dad was a old school, hardworking Midwestern farmer and laborer. Together we put up hay, planted crops, killed chickens and fixed whatever needed fixing. My father gave to me incredible wisdom and practical skills about survival and tenacity. Although he stopped drinking when I was in high school, his depression and anguish lingered in the shadows of our home. I had numbed myself to the sorrow. In 2004, I succeeded in linking my inner feelings with an outer expression, a monumental drawing titled The Great Exaltation. With my earlier attempts, I had tried to express exaltation without having made my passage through my personal inner grief and sorrow. Without authentically acknowledging those inner feelings of loss, I was never going to make art of excellence. I tried cheating my way to that higher aesthetic. I was trying to convey joy while avoiding grief. The best of artists are able to express and feel lament and sorrow. I believe without this ability, allowing inner space for the humanity of loss and despair, art as well as life is impoverished. Most of us have lost something deeply meaningful. That sliver in our soul is the grief of losing the creative. Play, imagination, and creativity get fractured around age seven. These three elements are the foundations of how we learn. These three vital aspects of our young lives begin to be labeled frivolous, superficial, and a waste of time. The benefits of creativity, imagination, and play within all curricula are then lost to the urgency of scholastic performance. Academics, test preparation, and test taking lay siege and occupy the school day. The creative is slowly diminished. With every passing year, there's less time in the day for kids to express their creativity, use their imagination, and be playful. The likelihood of setting the creative aside increases as home, schools, and communities place more demands and obligations on children's time. We end up misplacing the creative like an old toy, or as in many cases, 
that longing and desire for a relationship with the creative, if not nourished, often turns into depression, addictions, or numbness. Ask a room full of five-year-olds who's an artist, all their hands shoot up. Wait five years, ask those same kids that same question, hardly any of the kids raise their hands. In her book, Daring Greatly, University of Houston professor Brene Brown notes, 42% of those interviewed in her shame research said they experienced serious shaming in school directly related to their creativity. I imagine many of you have your own stories of creative collapse. A friend once told me she stopped making art in third grade because the teacher in front of the entire class made fun of a drawing she just made. A close friend shared that she couldn't be creative at home because her family would humiliate and ridicule her. A woman recently told me that she stopped singing because in grade school during music class, the girl in front of her turned around and said, stop it, you can't sing. These cumulative creative fractures and collapses have wounded us individually and I dare say have wounded our culture. In our youth, we are splintered when the pressures to compete academically overshadow and trivialize creativity. We become untethered from meaning and purpose when social structures denigrate and restrict imagination, originality, and play. Individually and collectively, creative collapse has interrupted our potentials as humans and is stifling true cultural progress. Think back to when you were five or six. What kinds of play held your attention? What did you play when told to stop? You couldn't wait to start again. Did you love to write stories? Did you take things apart and put them back together? Did you wake up thinking about playing your guitar? Maybe it was clay or paint that captivated you. Maybe you loved to sing or you just couldn't stop dancing. What if you tried that again? Start singing, start dancing, have fun with this. Be daring, be surprised. Your love for clay may turn into a new interest, writing poetry. Be playful with your possibilities. I'm prompting your reunion with the creative. I'm reminding you, you once looked at the world and thought about it with super creative eyes. You once approached every hour with a wide open imagination and a passion to become and express your unique original self. Reunion with the creative requires risk. The risk of re-engaging your imagination. The risk of remembering how to play. The risk of connecting to your original creativity the risk of meaning yourself. If we don't risk on our individual levels, how are we going to make any progress on the planetary level? All of us as children lived and breathed the creative. And that child is still there, waiting for you to find what's been lost with honesty, joy, and of course, exaltation. Thank you very much.